when we look at how we are responded to as a child, particularly when we're upset, particularly when we get angry or particularly when we say no to something, how did our parents respond? Now, because most of us grew up in a behaviorism paradigm, we either would have been shut down, we would have been sent to our room, maybe we were hit, maybe we knew really, really early on it was not okay to say anything back. We just had to be silent and good in order to survive. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Groves Podcast. Today we are dialing this up remotely because we have Australian speaker, educator, author, school builder, Lael Stone. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me, Mark. And I should say therapist because that's the background of the work that you've done. And when I encountered your work, which is so apropos because I'm a new father, it was on about how to raise emotionally intelligent children. And I thought, well, the world needs more of those. I'd like to be able to do that. And I'm sure there is components to that that are, you know, we can all implement. So thanks for the work you do. I'm super excited to chat with you. I just discovered that you build schools now. So that's new. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. So where should we start here? Like with how do you even define what an emotionally intelligent child is? Because I would imagine that a lot of people think they raised emotionally intelligent children and then people end up in a relationship with those children and are like, this isn't emotionally intelligent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that happens a lot. Well, I, <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I've worked with children for a really, really long time. And one of the things that I often find really funny is parents will contact me and say, I've got all these issues with my five-year-old. Can I bring my child to see you? And I actually don't see children. I only work with the adults because You're children- like, we're going to need you. Yeah, that's exactly it. Children are always responding to their environment and they are always- you know, what we're seeing on the outside is always a reflection of what's going on in the inside. And that is usually connected to what is happening in the environment they're in, whether that is in a schooling system, whether it is in the home, whether it is with in-laws or relatives or that kind of stuff. Children are always gauging, hey, is it safe to be who I need to be? Can I express myself? fully and they look around them and and gauge right from the very beginning is this safe is this okay to do this and that starts right when they're teeny tiny little babies like where you are right now with your son and so I always come back to if we want to raise emotionally intelligent children it starts with us as the guides and the adults around what are we modeling to them how are we responding to their feelings and emotions and the most important piece how much work have we done on our own stories so that we don't end up projecting that onto our children. So I think when we look at how do we raise emotionally intelligent children, well, the first place has to start with us. And it starts with us tuning into, all right, well, where's my stories? Where's my baggage that I'm carrying? Where's all my unresolved wounds and trauma and stuff around me not getting my needs met and how much of that is playing out in my life right now. Now, I know you're so all over that when it comes to relationships because often we bring those deeper wounds from our needs that we didn't get met from our parents to our relationship and and we choose a partner and go, hey, you will play out this shadow stuff for me excellently. So I'll choose you (laughs) because you're going to play out my dad stuff. Yeah, perfect. I often joke, we think we choose partners because we think they're sexy or, you know, we'll make great babies together or something. But actually we look at them and go, oh, you've got my dad's story going on. So you'd be great for my uh, soul's evolution. Yes, yes. (laughs) I wouldn't mind hooking up too, but you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's crazy and it makes sense, right? Why often people will attract the wrong people or what we think are the wrong people right. because yeah. they're bringing our stories to the surface to us to be healed and looked at and felt. And as much as we might do that in relationship, children are the most magnificent mirror for that. So our beautiful babies so and children come along and then they're standing there going, all right, Hey, Dad, I can see that you've got a story around trust, so I'm going to play out something around behavior around trust. And, and hey, Mom, I can see that you've still got some stories around abandonment and separation, so let me bring that to the surface. surface. And our children children are really our greatest teachers teachers because they are bringing to us a story that says, hey, 
You need to heal this because if you don't, you're going to project that onto me. And guess what? I don't want to carry your story. I I need to be free to be who I need to be in the world. And that's where I think we often find the challenges and the rub within parenting because our kids are standing there going, hey, let me me model back to you what, what is here. So when we come back to how do we raise emotionally intelligent children, it is really around firstly us looking at our own work. And the more we do our own work, the less our children have to carry and then we're able to guide them and and show them what it is to be emotionally aware which is being able to tune in to how we feel it's being able to own our stories it's not about projecting onto someone else you make me feel like this or or you did that to me it's as we model it and as we guide our children through that that's where they develop that beautiful emotional intelligence i'm curious someone said to me when jasper when we first had jasper because i didn't notice things coming up for me with him. I mean, Kai and I have done a lot of work on our own personal stuff in our relationship. And then what I found was just due to the exhaustion, and then now we have this other being that we're orienting towards. Her and I just wrote a book together. It hasn't come out yet, but that actually, ironically, we joke, was actually a great preparation for having a child because we both have different ways of writing and creating and We also have different ways that we orient to needs, like, you know, subtle differences. She's got the mother hormones and connection and it's different, right? I find there's a little more urgency for her. And for me, I'm like, he's good. Like, oh, hold on. You know, there's a little more. Also, he doesn't eat from me. So there's so many different aspects that I can't begin to understand, but I can try to conceptualize. You know, like, I don't know what it's like for touch to always mean need. And I really understand, I mean, her and I talk about this, but what was interesting with him, there's one thing that I noticed come up for me and someone said to me, and this is what I'm curious about your thoughts about, cause it sounds a little like beyond esoteric, like maybe a little ungrounded. They said, every challenge that you have with your child in their developmental stage is a reflection of what didn't get met in your time in that developmental stage. And I thought, well, that's interesting But I'm not sure that like when I was four weeks old, my mother's lack of capacity or whatever was going on in her life is now reflective in my inability to maybe soothe him in this moment or whatever was. And what I did notice, just to give more context, which is beyond even just that moment, is that I noticed that when I would rock him to sleep, because I am 44, so I spent 44 years where my life has basically been oriented around me and Kai and our dog, but mainly me. And when I was rocking him to sleep, I noticed myself wanting him to get to sleep so I could get to the things I need to do. And this was powerful because I was observing it, not doing it. But I noticed resentment, like this feeling of resentment of like, yo, bro, like you you got to go to sleep because dad's got some shit to do. And I was sitting with it. I'm like, wow, your life is no longer about you. And that's one of the most beautiful things. But this death is real. Like this is something that I'm allowed to mourn. But what I noticed was shame coming up. And I didn't book this for a therapy session, just so we're clear. (laughs) Uh, But I thought for people listening, they might experience shame for feeling resentment towards their child. And I wanted to normalize it. And I think it is normal. So I want to normalize it for me. Okay. So (laughs) it is, it is normal because I love how you say it. And it's very true. When we become parents, we have a death of the old way of being, you know, there's lots of losses that we're going to have that we can mourn. And then there's also these amazing gains that are going to happen with having a child and what comes to us. And I love what you bring up. We can hold a space of deep love and protection. And this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And at the same time, think, God, I just wish you would go to sleep or can't you just leave me alone for a few minutes and if we've got a toddler or all of that is very, very normal because I think one of the most key components as a parent and something that is so fundamental to learn right from the beginning is we cannot be the parent we often want to be if we do not meet our own needs. And this is the same in relationships, right? Is that if, and it's very tricky when you have babies or little people because it is very labor intensive. They need you all the time. You know, we are there doing all the things that we need to do to keep them alive and connection and attachment and all those things. 
And so it's really normal to be like, God, I just, I just want to go to the toilet on my own, or I just, I need to go and do these things, right? I mean, every mother everywhere will tell you they know exactly that's how it feels, and many fathers as well. And I think it's really important to just be like, we can hold love and just adoration for this little being and have those feelings at the same time. And so I often say whenever those edges come up, well, then it's an invitation to go, all right, what need is not being met here for me? Now, sometimes it is when your kiddos are going through tricky stuff and all the things that you want to do, you kind of have to drop them because you're just you being present with them and maybe they're unwell or they're going through something. And, and they are the parts of servitude that we learn in parenting. You know, we learn that we're just like, okay, it isn't just about me anymore. And those hours, you know, and I, I, I often reflect back on this. My children are adults now and I, I think back to all those years that felt so long and hard when they were little, when they needed me all the time. And then being over the other side of that, you go, wow, they are just a blip in time. I don't ever regret putting to the side the email I had to send in order just to be with them and stroke their head, right? Now, at the time, you can feel frustrated by it. But as I look back, I go, I never regret not prioritizing attachment and connection because it only is there for a small amount of time. And it's interesting as we do that, then that builds a lot of the foundation for the relationship we want to have with them as adults, right? Or in through that adolescent and those teen years. Now, it also doesn't mean though that we sacrifice ourselves just for our children because it is vital that we teach our children about boundaries and about meeting our needs because right from the very beginning, our children are watching everything we do. So as you're talking about rocking your son and there's a part of you like, oh, come on, dude, go to sleep. I need to do this. It is okay to feel that. And it's also okay to go, hey, there's a part of me that feels like I'm meeting my needs and, and that's tricky. I'm going to observe it. And right, if I can be present for the next half an hour, I will as I do this. And I can also see, hey, maybe if we're both feeling like this, we need a little bit of extra support in our unit at the moment, which may mean, can we ask grandparents, can we outsource someone to come in just for a few hours so that we can meet our own needs, whether that's emotionally, whether it's going for a run or doing some yoga or just being quiet by yourself or doing a little bit of work and then coming back to be present with our kids. It is a juggle. And I think the thing is, and I've said this for 20 years now, parenting is so hard in the day, in the age that we're living in, because we do not have the village that we are meant to when it comes to raising children. We are not living with our family and our relatives to say, hey, gosh, I really need to do this stuff. Could you be with the baby for an hour? And you know that your baby's being loved on by someone who cares for them. We are parenting on our own in these little houses by ourselves. And then what we do is we find it tricky, which is really understandable. And then we give ourselves a hard time for finding it tricky. Then we bring in the shame, then we go, I should be loving it. Then we think I'm not coping if we find that we know we're not doing it well when it's really our systems that are deeply letting us down, that we do not have the foundation in the village there to hold us to do it. And so that that is the theme that I have seen for all these years I've been working with. I think many, many parents will relate to it, is that we are trying to raise our kids with as much awareness and consciousness and, and give them all the things that we want for them and all that kind of stuff. And usually it's at the cost of ourselves. And that actually does not serve our children either because, again, they are watching us. They are watching our relationship to boundaries. They are watching our relationship to speaking our truth. They are watching our relationships to self-care. They are watching our intimate relationship with each other. And so as they are watching all of that, it's building an imprint and a foundation of, well, this is what life looks like. And so, so much of, I think, when you're sharing about what's going on for you here at the moment is so real and it's so beautiful to actually own it and speak it. And also then ask the question, okay, moving forward, how do we make sure we all get our needs met here? That is the goal. How do we meet the needs of our beautiful son? How do we need, meet the needs of each other in relationship? How do I hold space so you can do what you need to do and I can do what I need to do? How do we do this? Because if we don't have these conversations and come from a place of connection, then what we end up doing in relationship with children is we end up keeping score and we end up playing the game who's doing it tougher. 
right? And that game looks like this for so many years and I did it in my early parenting, which is I'm at home with the baby and the kids all the time and my partner's like, and I'm trying to earn all the money. And when we'd come back together, we would just compete of who was doing it harder and nobody wins. And our children are usually in the middle of it going, "Mm, this doesn't feel good, so let me act out in a certain way in order to get your attention until, you know, we began to see the patterns and the themes there and actually came back to actually how do we support each other? How do we both get our needs met here? How do we work as a team for the whole of our family? But again, as we circle back, it ties back into what we watched in our family of origin. It ties back into our patterns and beliefs and stories that that we have, our wounds that we bring forward. It's like full-on therapy. (laughs) (laughs) If you haven't heard me talk about Cozy Earth Sheets before, let me tell you, I'm about to introduce you to the greatest sheets you will ever have touch your body. Anytime someone comes to our house and stays in our guest room, they always want to know what is the bed situation? What are the sheets that we have? Their sheets, their comforters, their duvets, everything is magic. Their bedding is naturally breathable. It's temperature regulating. It's so damn soft. It's ethically sourced viscose from bamboo. It's incredible. And the brand was featured on Oprah's favorite things, but before that it was featured on Mark's favorite things. Like I discovered this brand years ago before I ever even chatted with them about being a sponsor for the podcast. And because I love their product so much, I asked for an exclusive offer for you and you get 40% off site-wide. And now they have pajamas. They have like loungewear. So not only do you get to wrap yourself in the experience of the sheets as clothing, but you then get to get into the bed in that. So you're like double wrapped. And so all you got to do to save 40% off site-wide is use the code GROVES at checkout. So just my last name, G-R-O-V-E-S. So go to CozyEarth.com, C-O-Z-Y. E-A-R-T-H dot com and use the code Groves and you get 40% off all their products. It's so many complexities too, because it's yeah. like so many both ends. You know, I think about, you know, my experience with Kai and I talk, you know, I remember one day I had a whole day of like Zoom meetings or something. And, you know, she wanted something from me at the end of the day. And I felt it was probably not true, but I was tired from all the meetings and I felt like she was minimizing the amount of time that I spent on fricking screens all day. And like now I needed to do this. And I was like, hey, I would have traded Zoom meetings all day for Holden Jasper. And then there was a feeling like that's easier than when I, you know, like, and it was great because it stimulated a conversation about And I feel like we do come back to this conversation a lot because it's all new terrain for us is recognizing the value that right now our agreement is that, you know, uh, there's lots of support in the morning I take him. So she has time. And then as soon as I finish work, I try to do the same and we have family around us and we move towards family for that reason, because you were talking about village. And what I find is that there's this conversation because the idea of provider in a way has been shamed or devalued in society. It's like, that's the masculine role. That's toxic masculinity. That's, and there are elements where that has been used for financial abuse. And so many people have these inherited patterns where that actually was an unhealthy dynamic. And it's interesting now to see, because I can observe it from so many different, now that I'm a parent too, but to be able to see how when I look at this generation of men, and we don't have to get deep into this, but when I look at like the 60, 70, 80 year old men, I feel like they are an abandoned generation. They were told to go to the office, the work, the factory. And then as society evolved into requiring more emotional intelligence from people in general, but especially men, where emotional intelligence was actually not valued in men at all. So they did the thing they were told would bring value and they spent 50 years at factories and then they came home and their wives were like, you don't give me what I need. I'm gone. And they're strangers in their homes. And I have so much compassion for that. I have compassion, of course, for the other side that is the victim of that experience too, the women. But I'm like, man, where's the compassion for these men? And now you see what I'm reconciling with. And also I think Kai and I in the discussion is like the witnessing of how that hasn't been healthy for women to now like this is actually a healthy dynamic and somehow we're being, you know, like women go crush it and become a boss babe. Oh, but also be a stay-at-home mom. And if you do one or the other, you'll be shamed by someone or someone else. And so I'm like, fuck what everyone else thinks, <laughs> part of my language. I'm not sure if you've been exposed to my language before. So. Oh, no, no, <laughs> feel free. <Go. laughs> fuck what everyone else thinks. But there still is this negotiation with cultural expectation where you have to separate yourself from culture 
which is so healthy. So that's a long expression. What do you think about it? <laughs> do I have more therapy? I think you're right on the money. I mean, it's interesting. I often look at that also through the lens of emotional intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. Because for a really, really long time, particularly men, and this is, I sit with you, I have a lot of compassion for men because the message they've received from our culture for a really, really long time is don't be vulnerable, don't be weak, suck it up, keep going, we value grit, all that kind of stuff. And then what happens is, you know, that's what they've been modeled, that's what they watch with their fathers, their grandfathers, that's what being a man is, right? Yeah. But the reality is we all have feelings and what men often learn to do is, well, actually everyone learns to do, is we learn to either repress our feelings when we feel them because it's not safe to express them or we hold on to them and it turns into aggression. And so when we feel threatened or powerless or we feel people are making fun of us and those feelings that are stored in our bodies come pouring out, projected onto everyone. And so here we are, I think, at a time where we've been saying for a long time, men, you need to be more emotional and you need to say how you're feeling, yet no one's really role modeled that to them, right? And they've been doing the job that, that the best job they know how, which is either shut it down and numb it. Or, you know, get really angry when something doesn't go the way I want it to. Now, women can actually do the same. We all do the same, right? Because most of us were not modeled healthy ways to express feelings. Most of us didn't grow up in a family of origin where when our dad got angry, he stood there and said, gosh, I'm so angry. I need to go for a run and move this energy through my body. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or I'm really angry. I'm going to shake my body and put on some music. And <laughs> Does right. anybody want to do um, maybe some Zumba? <laughs> yeah, that we definitely get wasn't. That, we? we get slammed doors. We get yelling. You might yeah. have, you know, compassion. You know, with deep empathy and compassion for people. You might have even been hit. You might have been yelled at. That anger, which is a buildup of their feelings and usually their wounds and their traumas and their hurt, was coming out because they had no other idea how to deal with that. Right. And so we know that that is a huge story. Or the other option is when something didn't go well, they just became blank and shut down. Right. And again, women could do so. We, we all learn to do this. We either numb our feelings or we project it onto other people as opposed to healthy ways of expressing it. And so, you know, coming back to your first question, how do we raise emotion, emotionally intelligent children? Our children have to see us model healthy ways to move our feelings. And, and this is what I say to parents all the time. Kids are so hardwired, tuned into us. They emotionally know when something's off. So your little bubba is, you know, still very young, but feeling and sensing everything that's going on with you guys. But if you have a toddler or a school-aged child and, you know, if you are sad, your child will come up to you and say something like, are you okay, mum? And if we go, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, right, what we're doing in that moment is we are teaching our children to discount what their energetic gut response is saying. Oh, interesting. in that moment a child is going, hey, I feel that something's off. And when we go, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, the child goes, oh, well, maybe my gut's wrong and the adult's right, so I can't trust that. That's interesting. I've never thought about that. Sorry, I had to, I was like, wow. Yeah. Now we are far better off in that moment saying, you know what, sweetheart, I'm feeling really sad today and that's mine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call a friend because I feel better when I speak to someone or I'm going to go do journaling or I'm going to do some yoga and it's okay. My sad is mine and I can move it. Now in that moment you have modeled to your child, I am responsible for this. It's got nothing to do with you. I am going to model tools and ways for me to be with these feelings and to move them. And then the child watches and goes, that's what you do when you're sad. You reach out to someone, you be quiet with yourself, you just cry and let it move through you. That is what healthy modeling of these feelings look like. And it's the same with anger. And when we are angry, we are far better off saying, I am angry and that is mine. And so I'm going to go outside and I'm going to yell at the trees. Do you want to come watch me? (laughs) Right. Or I'm going to put on a song and do some angry dancing, or I'm going to pick up a hold of socks and I'm going to throw them as hard as I can at the wall. And this again is our children are watching so that next time they're angry, they're like, I need to throw socks. And you're like, yeah, buddy, come on, let's do it. Right. Let me help you move these feelings through your body because they're just feelings. And our job is to find a healthy way to express them without projecting them onto anyone else, harming anyone else, hurting any things. It's just to feel it and let it go. And you know, what's fascinating. And I think probably 
one of the my greatest successes, and I've done a lot of things in the world, is watching my own children be so deeply in tune with their feelings and know what they need. I remember one of my most favourite stories is my son when he was 19. It was kind of the beginning of when the pandemic was happening and he lost his job like a lot of other people. And he rang and he said, Mum, you know, are you and Dad at home? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I need you. I'm coming home. And I'm like, okay, darling. And he walks in the door and he's like, you know, six foot two, huge human. And I look at him and he's just, he just looks devastated. And he goes, Mum, I just need to cry and I need you to just be with me. And he came and sat on the couch. And I always joke, I sit on his lap and hug him because he's so big. (laughs) I'm sitting on his lap hugging him. And then I sat beside him and he just said, I just need to cry. And so my husband and I just sat beside him and he just cried. And then he told us what had happened. And then he said, I feel better. I just needed to get it out. Okay, now, now what am I going to do? And I'm like, well, mate, I I trust that you'll find whatever you need to. And then he opened himself up to possibility of what could happen. Mm, Because he moved through the emotion. Yeah, Yeah, as a 19-year-old male, I'm like, he knows that that is the safest thing for him to do in that moment is, yeah, he can feel angry around what's happening, but he was like, I just need to feel, I want to come to somewhere where there's no judgment, where my parents just love me no matter what. And he expressed that. And I'm like, that to me is a sign of beautiful success that he knows that he just needs to feel and then he's able to let it go. And then he did move into possibility and a whole other world opened up for him and he moved forward. And so I look at that and think, okay, for all of our children, what we've modeled a lot of is feeling our feelings. And I say to parents, it doesn't mean you get into the fetal position on the lounge room floor and sob hysterically. That can feel quite confronting for children, right? You know, we need to sometimes take a private moment. Yeah, we might need to take those bigger feelings to someone to help them hold us for it. But it's very important for us, our children, to to watch us feel frustrated and to watch us make mistakes and mess up and then figure out how to repair and correct it. And all these things our children are watching constantly. And so if we think about, well, who do I want my child to be in the world? Well, they're going to base that on me. So where am I not owning my stuff? Where am I? If I want my child to be you know, someone who is brave and courageous and tries new things and takes risks. Well, am I doing that? Are they seeing me actually stretch and put myself out there and do things that are hard? You know, there's so many things. And I know this can feel like an enormous pressure because parents will be like, oh my God, <laughs> like this is, this is full on. And we're never going to get it right. There is no perfect, right? There is absolutely no perfect in parenting. Our kids are going to have story no matter what because we are human. But I think it's a really important conversation to have with yourself, with your partner around, who do we want our beautiful child to be in the world, right? And when we write down the things that we want for them, well, are we modeling that? Are we being that? How do we show them healthy ways to be that in the world? You know, they're the the questions I think we should be asking. There's a few things that I heard from you that I just wanted to highlight that you said that when we consider the way we're being in their early childhood, right? The things we're trading, like work, like the email, like maybe our phone, whatever it is that you're setting the foundation, like that time is actually so important. And we might see it as a loss, but it is ultimately a massive gain. And so I can be with the sort of death of whatever is dying. But I think when I connect to what you're saying and the actual immense value of, like I look at, whenever I look at my phone around him, I almost never do now. And I, I almost never have when he's napping. Sometimes I'll look at it because there's not, I'm there and I'm chilling and he's sleeping. But otherwise, if I'm with him, I might have a quick text to send, but otherwise I'm like with him and my screen time has gone way down. And I think about how much I'm getting from just like the attunement because I get so much from it. Let's be honest, like nature designed that. I also was, I remember someone telling me, a friend of mine, I think it was Vienna Farron, who's a therapist, she was telling me that when the child is born, they look a lot more like their father because it's designed to reduce abandonment and also abuse. And he looked a ton like me. He was like a little (laughs) mini me. Now he's starting to look like his mom. And I've enjoyed just the, I mean, the coos, the giggle. Ike, his laugh right now is kind of like, it's like, "Uh, uh," you know, (laughs) but holy moly, I'm not even doing anything funny. But the fact that he... For my laughter ego, it's the, oh my God, it just like makes my heart melt. It's intoxicating. Hmm. It's ridiculous. It's better Mm -hmm. than anything I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. And 
I can remember really fondly now to like the feeling of what it was like to like be on my dad's chest while he read me a story or the soothing of my mom holding me when I'm upset, much like your son experienced even as an adult. Like there's something about being able to cry with your parents, assuming they were safe, that is just like cathartic and just profound. The other thing I was wondering is when you look at that emotional like when you own your own emotions, because you're saying, let's use this language that says, this is mine, which I love, because then now you're drawing a boundary and you're delineating like, because a lot of kids, and I think this is true for most kids, is you usually have one parent who's more the pursuer, right? The anxious, the codependent, whatever, and in relationship with someone who's more under-functioning. You know, we have all the language for all of it. And I find at least pattern wise, when you commute, talk to people and you understand their childhood and you look at their patterns, you start to see that they were often enmeshed with that parent who was more the anxious, more the, because of generational roles and things like that, it tends to be the mother, you know, not always off, obviously, but just by the framework of gender roles, et cetera. Because when I heard you earlier say that if you have that resentment and you're not serving yourself, then I wanted to just dig a little deeper into this. Is this where we pass on that wound of martyrdom? Is this how we pass on that wound of repression and enmeshment? Like, how does the language look? Because I would imagine a lot of us, and I'm sure I'll catch myself, how does the language look that creates enmeshment? Because that is such a common, like avoidance we can understand because there's like a fear of closeness, a fear that was wounding. But yeah, what is, and I mean, we could become avoidant due to enmeshment too. Yeah. Well, I think it's really interesting, isn't it? Of And again, where does it begin in the story, in the line, right? We just, we carry it through generations, generations. And, and I often say, you know, parents who do my workshops or courses, one of the things I always come back to is this, you so have to acknowledge the courage it takes to do this work, to draw a line in the sand, to say, I'm not going to carry that forward. It's huge. And why it often feels very hard to change a lot of these patterns and stories and imprints is because it's been generations worth that have been part of the lineage that we have come from. So as a first point, I always love to just say the work we are doing to try and be a conscious parent is hard and it can feel big. And we we take two steps forward and one back and, and it's like learning a brand new language because it's something that was never spoken to us in home right. at home so it's a huge it's a Makes huge sense. shift and so I think what I have seen a lot in my work too is particularly and we'll talk about the mother for the minute when the mother is I guess not connected to herself and her worth and her truth a lot of raising her child becomes about does the child love me and if the child loves me then I'm good enough if my child is good then that means I'm a good mother and so a lot of the worth around the mother and look this can happen for fathers as too comes through the lens of if my child fits the bill of what I want or behaves the way I want them to or loves me in the way I need, then I will be okay. And that is often a subconscious pressure that a lot of children carry and they feel because often then what happens is they learn very early on when they get upset, if a three-year-old's having a beautiful, gorgeous meltdown because we cut their sandwich the wrong way or you give them the wrong color cup or whatever it is, and the mother then freaks out and can't handle it and either shuts down massively or gets angry, the child learns pretty early on oh, it's not safe for me to do this. Now, particularly if the mother is in a space where she can't cope and it's too much, the child then goes, oh, it's not okay for me to be upset because it's my mum's going to be upset and she can't cope and therefore I need to be responsible for her and I need to take care of her needs. And so what happens is the child learns to squash down their feelings. They become a very good boy or a very good girl. They are always looking through that lens as, is my parent okay? And what do I need to do to keep them happy? Because then if they're happy, then that will feel better for me. And then, you know, like it just is this cycle that goes on. Whereas ideally where we want to be is in a space is that the parent is able to own their own feelings. They know that their worth is not caught up on whether their child is the best piano player in the world or they get straight A's at school or they look a certain way. They know that their child is a sovereign being. And when there is anger and when there is sadness and when there is upset, the parent is able to meet that with a calm that says, hey, I'm here, let it out. And I trust your feelings. I trust what you need and I'm here to guide you around that. And so that is the ideal of what we want. And then the message and the imprint 
the child receives is it is safe for me to feel all I'm feeling. Now, most of us, and I'll say the generation that we're in, grew up in a behaviorism paradigm, which meant that we were rewarded when we were good, we were punished when we were bad. And this still exists today massively that, you know, we are they a good baby? I mean, what is a good baby? I mean, it's ridiculous. I was wondering that too. I actually do have to call bullshit on this saying, sleep like a baby. I yeah, want yeah, nothing to do yeah. with that. Sleep like a teenager, it should be. <laughs> yeah, sleep like when I was 17 and went out drinking the night before. Yes, totally, totally, totally. <laughs> so I think the thing is that it's um, ideally what we're looking at here is that you know, the imprints that we take on board when we are children, which is, is it safe for me to be who I really need to be in the world? That's often what the the core wound comes back to. So with all the adults I work with, when we look at, you know, the fear of putting ourselves out in the world or intimate relationships or whatever, the wound when we trace it back is always, am I enough? You know, is it safe for me to be me? Now, that all starts when we look at how we are responded to as a child, particularly when we're upset particularly when we get angry or particularly when we say no to something, how did our parents respond? Now, because most of us grew up in a behaviorism paradigm, we either would have been shut down, we would have been sent to our room, maybe we were hit, maybe we knew really, really early on it was not okay to say anything back. We just had to be silent and good in order to survive. And this is this is the core attachment stuff that we all have, right? We learn this very, very early on. Now, again, I have a lot of compassion for all humans and for our parents because they were doing the best job they knew how as well, right? And this is where I think when we come to parenting with a conscious lens these days, what we have to look at is what we didn't get or the messages and the imprints we received as children and then what are we then passing on to our own children now? And for me, where it turns up the most is when our kids get angry, when they get really upset, when they have big feelings, our reaction to it gives us a really strong indication as to how we were raised and what that felt for for us and then how we can stand in a place where we can make it safe enough for our children to feel who they you know feel what they need to feel because the message we want to give our kids is this is that I love and accept all of you not just the parts that are good and happy, not just the parts that try really hard and make me proud, but I love all of you, the messy parts of you, the angry parts, the sad parts, all of you is welcome here. Yet when I ask a lot of adults, did you feel that from your parents? Most adults say, no, no way. You know, I had to be good in order to be loved. And so we can see the cycle continue. We can see it be passed down. And I think when we reach a point where we go, actually, I want to do this differently, or I have more awareness around it, and we start to do the work, the work often looks at, well, how was I responded to when I was a child and I was upset? And are there wounds and hurts there I still need to work with? So then that increases my capacity to be with my child in their messy feelings and be anchored within it. So I searched forever for a non-toxic deodorant stick, and I'm not sure about you, but my experience with them is once I Googled the ingredients, I was like, ah, this has still got some stuff in it. Or if it wasn't toxic, it just didn't work that good. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for letting the pheromones out, but it was not the, not the right kind of pheromones. But I'm happy to say I finally found one that I love, and it's from a company called Primally Pure. And they don't just make deodorant, they have a whole line of non-toxic skincare products that are made with ingredients that you don't have to Google. Mm, isn't that great? They're headquartered in Southern California, and all the stuff is done by their skincare chefs who value freshness and purity. So I'm very excited to be partnering with Primally Pure. And the company's founder, Bethany, is a mom of two and the wife of a farmer who truly cares about the integrity of the ingredients they use and the products they create. And for me, as a new father, this matters because I want to have the best, cleanest possible products for my baby Jasper. That is so important to Kylie and I. And this company has a whole baby line. So if this sounds like something that's really important to you and you don't know exactly which products to use, they do help you create a skincare routine with it awesome quiz that they do on their website. And the best part is that Primally Pure offers a happiness guarantee and they'll give you your money back if you're not satisfied. But I know you will be because Kylie and I absolutely love and trust their products. So if this all sounds like something you want to check out and try, Primally Pure has given you, my listeners, a special code to use when you order. Just go to primallypure.com today and use the code Mark Groves, just my name, and you get 15% off your order. So that's Primally, P R I M A. L-L-Y-P-U-R-P-U-R-E dot com and use the code Mark Groves at checkout. Save 15%. 
that work, uh, the deep work, man. Because I think of a lot before I had a kid, my perspective was romantic relationship might just be important enough to you that you'll change, that you'll heal, that that your desire to create what you've longed for will actually be enough for you to step into humility. And now I look and I'm like, well, if that wasn't enough, the love for this child, which I recognize that children are sometimes born into very stressful circumstances in the capacity, you know, what the world, especially in the United States, I live in Canada and the U.S., and the way that the U.S. values mothers with maternity leave is ridiculous. Like, I met a woman the other day who went back after three weeks. And I was like, first off, poor child, but also like, poor you. Now, what's interesting is she didn't have to go back. She chose to go back because she was very much into her work. And that's not, none of this is a judgment. But I was like, wow, like the society taught you that somehow your value was in that place and that you need to crush it. And like how not allow you to surrender into mothering. And also, you know, often it takes two paychecks to pay rent and mortgages and all these things. I mean, there's so the systems just compound on each other. And so there's not one wrong, but what you said before, like if we have village, then that makes it easier. Then they're like, hey, we got you. Like we'll help support you, you know, to f- so you can take some time. You know, I, in my business, I wanted to see what it was like to fully value a mother when they're on mat leave. So I pay my employees when they go on mat leave full pay for the whole year. Because in Canada, they give you like 50% of your pay or something. You end up being on employment insurance. But I was just like, what is that like? Like, even though it, you know, of course, cuts into quote unquote profits, I was like, there's got to be a greater payoff to society, to the business just the integrity to which we're making our way through the world. And I would rather do that and the business scrape by, you know, just to have that. Cause I'm like, what would it feel like for a mother to not have to think about that? And for the father too, who's in relationship. I'm curious, we talk about the impact of childhood on the behavioral outcomes of, as we become adults. I was recently looking at some data, I think Adam Grant wrote about it, but it was about the impact of technology on children as they age, and especially in boys. I know technology, social media has a larger impact on anxiety and depression in girls, but I'm curious about your thoughts on technology. For Kai and I, one thing that we have done is we're not showing him on social media like his actual face because we want him to choose. Like we've experienced social media in its extremes, especially me. And I was like, I don't want him to have to deal with any of that. I want him to make his way through the world and choose whether the world knows what he looks like. So I'm curious what you've seen, what the data says, and what you recommend. It's a good question, and it's a a big one. It's big. It's layered. If you could just solve all of it. Yeah, okay. So I'm like, this is a good chat because we're going to break down the world systems, how we change it, the whole thing. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, how long is this going for? Um, (laughs) Look, technology is really interesting. And I think we know it can be brilliant in creating connection. It can open up so many worlds. It also is one of the biggest, most massive repression mechanisms that we have out there. And I often look at technology this way, particularly when I talk to parents about it, is that our children at some point in their world are going to go, things feel too really hard and I want to numb out right? And so we can use food to do that. We can stay so busy that we don't have to feel technology, gaming, Netflix, being on Instagram, all those kind of things are the most perfect repression that we have out there, right? It's gold. It's just, it ticks all the boxes. Yeah. And considered completely normal. You get likes, you get dopamine, you might even get hookups. You got lots of things. Yeah, it just, it it plays into so much of, I think, I, am I enough? I'm not. So let's go onto media, social media so I can numb myself. And also, you know, I can maybe look, get some connection in the way that I deeply want. So I often talk about the antidote to repression is connection. And when we're looking at from a parenting point of view, I really invite all families to go, you got to choose what feels right for you, right? You know, you can't say to your kids, don't be on your phones if you're sitting there on your phone doing it, right? What are we modeling to our children as well? You text them that. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to be really mindful about what we're modeling. I also think we, you know, in each family, I'm like, particularly if you've got, you know, tweens and teenagers, you know, you set up all the different things that you can to keep them safe. You need to educate your children about what is online. I think it is so vital that we talk about the impacts of pornography. We talk about gaming. We talk about all these things. We have to give children all the information to understand why it's not great for their developing brains and why it can suck you in. But my bigger picture, of that is this, is that when parents come to me and they have an issue with their children on technology, then my question is, where's your connection? And they mean, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, how available are you to connect with your kids? Because when kids aren't feeling connected to us, they are going to naturally move towards numbing out. And particularly if they don't feel it's safe to express how they feel, they're going to want to numb out more. And so often the theme that we see comes up is that when children go to tech and they numb out and then we turn it off or we take it away, they have all these big feelings come out and then they go, oh my God, it's the tech. And I'm like, actually, it's not even so much the tech. I'm sure that has an impact impact on it but it's the fact that using that tech has just numbed what they're feeling and then when you take it away it's like all the feelings come pouring out it's an addiction right it's like anyone who's ever smoked in their life when they stop smoking what happens they get really angry they have a lot of feelings going on because that smoking what it's done is it's numbed all those feelings there and that's the same with any kind of addiction that we have whether it's drinking whether it's online shopping whatever All of those things that we do serve a purpose, which is I'm trying to make myself feel better and I'm trying to not feel what's going on. And then when we take it away, that's when all those feelings come out. So yes, tech is a huge problem, right? It's a huge problem in the sense of that in the family units, often we're not connecting. And so we are all on our own screens, like checking out, you know, just numbing out. And so as parents, I'm like, well, what are you modeling? Firstly, what are the boundaries and sets you're going to hold in your family? But also what connection are we offering to our children because if they're in the lack of connection they're going to move to repression and even if you took all the screens away right and you were still not connecting then they're going to find something else maybe it becomes food, maybe it becomes something else, because our fundamental need as humans is for connection. It is to feel seen. It is to feel heard. It is to connect with people. That is our driving force. And what technology does, particularly in this day and age, it says, well, hey, if you're not getting connection, here's a Band-Aid for you. And yes, tech has a lot to answer for and we can make it wrong. But for me, I see it as, well, we have to offer something else, you know, and and that when we offer something else, then creates the beautiful connection. And look, with my children, you know, going through those teen years and stuff and, you know, we we kind of bypass some of that, the stuff that the kids have got now, but, you know, it's still a huge part of their world. And so I was really conscious of, right, what are we modeling to them about tech? I'm going to talk to them a lot about all the different ins and outs of it. So they were really informed around how it looks and works. But my main thing was I need to connect with you every day in just certain ways, right? And even Be with you, be present. I am going to be present. I'm going to listen to how you feel. We're going to always have guidelines around we have no phones at our table at dinner time. We talk, we connect. I'm always attuning to them how they're feeling so I can check in with them. And one of the messages I gave them from really young is I really invite you to be aware enough of yourself to know when you're numbing out and when you need something Mm, else. And so then they began to learn God, I've been sitting on here for 45 minutes. This is too much. Okay, I need to go hang with someone or I need to talk to someone or I need to go move my body. It is about educating them enough to be able to tune into themselves to say, hey, where am I in this moment? Now, it's very hard for children to tune into themselves if they're numb, right, and if they modelled what that looks like. So, again, you know, there's many moving parts to it. But I think for me, particularly around technology, so much of it is around it is repression, which is what we do when we don't feel good and, what can we offer which is connection and we can actually bring something to that to help change the narrative gosh for adults that's i mean more that question seems to be actually more geared (laughs) to adults in that technology came into our lives without adult experience before us you know what i mean so like it was ushered in social media when it came in i think in like truly on en masse, maybe like 07 or something like that. I think about my first, I saw that there's a movie about Blackberry that just came out. And I was joking with a friend talking about Blackberries. And I said, you know, before that, I remember I would log in on my laptop for work and I'd, I'd do my emails and then I wouldn't check it till I got to a coffee shop or at home later. And I said, you know, Blackberries really were the changing moment where all of a sudden 
I thought it was convenience, which is, of course, what every government and every business sells you on everything and really gets you on it, right? Because like in our essence, we're pretty lazy. You know, like humans want the easiest path to everything. They think that's the key. My uncle, I remember when I was younger, said to me, there are two paths. One's the easy way, one's the hard way. And the only thing good about the easy way is it's easy. And I remember not really understanding that till I was older. And now I see that actually the way that might have more challenge, more fear, more whatever is actually expansive. And I think now when I didn't have a video game system growing up, we weren't allowed one. You had to get up to change the TV channel. I mean, that was a big barrier. And (laughs) you didn't have access to pornography. Like if you wanted to download a boob, you had to wait for the thing to load. And it would take a (laughs) while to get to the boob, you know? So you had to be really committed to it (laughs) or like get a magazine from a a store. But now what you're talking about is we all have access to these things and they are repressive. And I love that you said that the, the antidote to repression is connection. And I have a friend who has two boys and she was saying to me that one of their strategies with technology because my like nephew doesn't use technology. He's two years old. He hasn't been introduced to it. I believe that the American Pediatric Society doesn't recommend it before five now. But it's amazing. He spends his whole day outside. Like he's constantly playing. And I remember doing that as a kid. And when people are like, yeah, but I use technology to babysit my kid. And I'm like, I get that. Again, no ju- none of this is judgmental. It's just dialogue about the circumstances we're in. But man, somehow we survived before without iPads, kids figuring it out, playing with things, building things. And my friend was saying to me that what they do is they build in uh, weekends of power outages. And so their kids, no one in the home is allowed access to technology. And then they go out on hiking adventures and they go out on adventures. And the other thing that they do so that it's not just them who don't get it, like you were saying, what are you modeling? And the other thing that they do is they have like limited screen time and the two boys if one uses it, that eats up the screen time for both. So they're very collaborative about their screen time. But she said something interesting. And these are very like attuned kids, present kids, respectful kids. And she said that when they play, I forget what game, I think it was like Minecraft or some game. I can't remember what it was called. But she said that it's really interesting. They hardly ever play it. But what we notice is that after they're done playing, they're kind of little assholes. And I was like, huh, interesting. And I believe in that study that Adam Grant quoted, he was talking, and you might know the study, but he was talking about how the more screen time young people have, the more behavioral issues like ADHD that they have growing up. To me, that actually makes 100% sense because, and maybe I've never correlated this, I've never really thought about it just because I haven't gone into depth on it, but it makes sense because the way they're regulating is through technology. And so they don't, you were saying before, these are my feelings. So they're not learning how to be with their own feelings. They're being finding pornography or finding video games. Is that fair? I don't know. Yeah, of course. I, I, it's, it's really the perfect storm when you look at technology and the day and age that we live in, the disconnection that we have as a culture, the lack of support we have in the family network. Like it, it ticks so many boxes. And I love that you brought that up. There's no judgment. And I say that to parents all the time. I absolutely get it. If you've been working all day, you've got to make dinner, your kids can sit in front of a screen while you do stuff. It makes sense, right? I understand yeah, why we do it because we're that. all doing the best job we know how. I mean, if I was to look at what my repression of choice is, it's 100% binge watching a series. I'm like, oh my God, there's three seasons. This is awesome. Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso is so good. Amazing. Like that's what I go to. I don't necessarily turn to food or drinking or anything like that. I'm just like, I just want to numb out. So we all do it. And it's not that we should stop, right? I think we need to have the consciousness around it. It's the awareness when I'm I'm doing it. I'm like, I am aware that I'm doing this. Things are feeling (laughs) big. I am going to do this for a bit and then I'm might call a friend and have a chat or I'll do something else to connect in with myself. It's about having the consciousness around it that we begin to change it because it's here and it's not going anywhere. But I wanted to come back to, you know, I think a really important point, and this is something I see a lot, this is something I see in the school that we created, is that the lack of play 
and nature connection for children has a massive, massive impact. So when we created our school, we really consciously chose to be a tech-free school. So we do have technology, but the children the children never learn on it, right? Our children don't sit there and learn on iPads. Wherever we can learn, we always learn outside. We do most of our numeracy is always outside using nature and all sorts of different stuff that we've got to, to measure things, to learn things, all those kind of things. Because what we're seeing is the more connected the children are in nature, the more ready regulated their systems are, often the more creativity they step into. So I love technology. It facilitates my businesses. It helps me do amazing things in the world, right? And I I think it's incredible what we've created, but we have to find the balance. And I really do believe, you know, our children, the longer we can avoid them being exposed to it, the more we can get them out in nature, the more they can play and set up those foundations then and really focus on that connection, you know, even as parents, listening to their feelings, owning our stuff, then we're going to set up a stronger foundation for them to then be able to know how to navigate tech as they move into those kind of adolescent years. So when you built this school, I think about taking on such a endeavor. I'm curious, <laughs> what are the foundational elements of an emotionally intelligent child's education? I, I hear uh, tech-free on some level and I also hear nature. I'm also curious, as you answer that, what were parents' responses or resistances? I'm guessing their shit came up because our shit always comes up. But I'm just curious. Maybe it self-selects that the people who are coming towards that school are like, oh, I love all of this. Do it all. Get rid of my iPhone. Get rid of, you know, yes, yes. give me a tree. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, I think tech is a small part of it, but I think parents are drawn to it because, our philosophy or my philosophy in creating the school and and I built it with another woman because she was really wanting a school for her children to go to that really had that emotional safety because here in Australia and I'd say most schooling systems around the, around the world are really punitive, which means when you're Doing what I want, I'm going to put your name up on the board, or you get to you have to stay in at recess. And if you do well, I'll give you a star or a sticker. And it is really all about this: you must conform and, and tick the boxes of what I want. And I know that you just put your hand up because you're like, "Yeah, that was probably me." Name on the board? Uh, no, hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Corner board hallway. Or yeah, all of it. Yeah, my three children did not fit into the mainstream system because one's an athlete, so sitting down and writing was torturous for him. My middle child's super creative, needs to talk about it, use their hands to learn. Like, you know, I, I just navigated systems with my kids at school going, this just does not work for who they are in their spirit. So the whole essence of our school is based around children need to feel safe in order to learn. So, you know, my background is working with, you know, adults for a really, really long time and hearing their traumas always comes back to the same thing of of not fitting into this mold or feeling like they're stupid because they can't tick these boxes when actually they learn better by using their hands or moving their bodies. And most of the time, the reason why they didn't learn is because they were in shutdown because it did not feel safe. So from a trauma-informed perspective is that there is no learning going on when we are in a fight or flight state, gauging our surroundings all the time to, am I going to get in trouble? am I okay? Am I enough? Right? So the whole philosophy of our school was how do we keep it so that children feel really safe and seen? So the way we do that is we have really small class sizes. We have maximum 16 children in our, in the class. We have, we call our teachers guides. They're not called teachers. So we have a guide and we have an assistant guide. And the assistant guide's job is just to emotionally tune into the kids to see who's having a hard time. So if someone is really agitated and they're not up for learning, we're like, hey, do you need to go jump on the trampoline or let's go have a swing or how about we go feed the animals? So we are inviting the children to right from the very beginning when they're five and they start school, tune into how am I feeling and what do I need? So it is not ever about making a child wrong. You know, if a child is angry, we are always looking behind the behavior and going, I wonder what's what's here. Is there a need that's not being met? Do they need some information around something or do they need to just let out some feelings? Because, you know, they've got a two-year-old brother at home and it's really hard and they've got a whole lot of feelings about that and they need a safe place to let it out. You know, one of the things that one of our beautiful students at our school, they'd been to another school and they came to our school and they were saying to one of our guides, you know, the best thing I love about this school is that it's okay to cry. And I'm wow. like, oh, that was like music to my ears. That must have been the best thing you've ever heard. It was awesome because it just is that 
they feel safe enough to feel. And so, again, I come back to if we want to teach these children how to be emotionally aware, then we need to make all feelings okay. And we are guiding and teaching them to keep tuning into themselves. What am I feeling right now? What do I need? And within that, there's also that can we own our own stuff, not project it onto someone else? All these fundamental things that most adults are still struggling with, we are really holding as the philosophy of our school. We also are very big on choice and autonomy, which means children can wear shoes or not wear shoes. They can climb trees. You know, they they can sit on the floor if they don't want to sit at the desk. They also have choice around how they learn. So we really invite them to tune into how they learn best and we really encourage them to develop that strength. And we also, one of my favourite things is we are also all about yes ideas. So our amazing principal at our school, you know, her door is always open and children will come in and go, I've got an idea, Claire. I think we should build, you know, a tree house. And she'll be like, I love it. Right. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to tell me what we're going to need to build it, how long it'll take. Like, and she sends them off on these assignments. And here are these children so who are cool. really reluctant learners, like reluctant to write, reluctant to do stuff. They go and they pour their heart into it because they're seeing this is something in the real world that they help they can create. And they're getting all this numeracy and literacy and they don't even realize it, right? They're learning through this love or this play or this this opportunity to be a part of something. Thing. So we're not just learning something because that's what the curriculum says. We're like, how do we bring this into the real world? So, and, and it has more relevance to children. So we're big on choice and autonomy. We're non-punitive, which means we don't ever shame or, or put kids' names on the boards. We're always looking behind the behavior. And we are really inviting them to to know that they belong here you know belonging is so important as a child and so that every child is unique and every child is amazing and every child belongs so you know what we're doing at the school and and it's interesting we've been open for three years now and the essence of the school was to help children to feel emotionally safe. But actually what we've discovered in our data, which I knew was going to happen anyway, is their learning has gone off the charts. So when we have to track their learning, which we do, of course it is going brilliantly because they feel safe, because they feel seen, because they're learning about stuff that lights them up and it's building that foundation and that love of learning for them and because they're feeling seen and relaxed in who they are, then, then it's unfolding. So it's a beautiful thing to have created and be part of. And and I often look at, you know, I spent three years of my life kind of creating it. And it's very hard to build a school here in Australia. Like it's really tricky, you know, as far as the governance and the legals and all those things. But I have to tell you, it's far better than what I ever dreamed it to be. And that's so much got to do with the incredible leaders that we have at the school and and the people who work there. They've taken this and actually just run with it in the most amazing way. And I really do hope and I and I do believe this that others will copy and follow what we do and and you know, I'm already helping some others set up similar schools so that we can we can change the system even if it's just a small piece of it, to say that there is another way that we can do it, which builds in again to this emotional holding that we want for children. How many children are usually in each class? 16. 16. That's a great size. And you said there's one guide and one emotional support? Yeah, assistant guide. Yeah, Assistant guide. That's so cool. Like I think about punitive free, but also when a kid is experiencing emotional whatever, frustration, antsy, that the question is, do you need to jump on a trampoline? Like, (laughs) do you need to talk about it? Do you need to, whatever, stomp your feet? I couldn't imagine being asked that as a kid. I remember listening to that TED Talk. I think it's the most popular TED Talk of all time, Our Schools Ruining Our Creativity by Sir Ken Robinson. And he talks about, I believe, the founder of, is it Juilliard? I forget, like a big dance school. And when she was a kid, the teachers were like, there's something wrong with her. And then the one teacher was like, there's nothing wrong with her and left the room, put on music and she started to dance. She's a dancer. And I thought that's so powerful. Like he, his expression is that we teach children from the neck up. And what you're saying is like, get them out, get them moving, get them immersed, get them in the key of emotional safety and belonging. Oh my God. Because even if you're not getting that at home, which can be the experience, especially if we haven't looked at our own wounding, as we've talked about, you pass it on. The school can provide that. Oh my Lord. It's not shocking to me that governments don't necessarily embrace children learning autonomy of choice, you know, but to be able to bring that to them. Wow. 
I've got to have you back on again because we could talk about everything all day. I'm so enamored by this conversation. And so first off, thank you for making the time and taking the time and accepting my invitation. Oh, it's my pleasure. I feel really honored to be here. I'm curious for people listening, where can they find more about your work, your courses, for teachers, for parents, and maybe where they can learn more about this, your new school building endeavor that you never thought you'd become? <laughs> Do you know, I often say when people say, tell me about building a school, one of the lines I always say is, I didn't even like education. I, I hated it because I hated school. I felt so misunderstood. So if you had told me seven or eight years ago, I'd build a school, I'd be don't be ridiculous. <laughs> but you never know where life takes you, right? I just feel like right, it was yeah. the perfect combination to bring, I guess, my work and, and my essence to something that could make a difference, you know? So anyway, you have to trust, you have to trust the bigger picture sometimes, don't you? So you can find me at Lael Stone. So the benefit of having a weird name is that on Google at the moment, I am the only Lael Stone. So if you Google me, you get me and all my stuff. Uh, you can find me on socials and my website is laelstone.com.au. And I have lots of different courses on there for parents. I've got courses. I run eight-week immersions, which is about helping parents go through all the imprints around their childhood, our imprints around trust and boundaries and self-care and play and all that stuff, which is really the journey of the inner stuff so that we can turn up in a better way for our parents. And then I have also webinars and stuff on there for educators around creating compassionate classrooms like what we do. And our beautiful school is called Woodline Primary. So if you search me up, you, you will see our school there as well. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for your time and, and thanks for sharing and the, and the amazing work you do. Ah, thanks for having me, Mark. 